Um, before we begin, we have a co-sponsor who I'd like to thank, which is the Institute of European Studies. Um, my name is Larry Rosenthal. I'm the chair of the uh, Center for Right-Wing Studies, it, uh, which is part of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues here in this building. Um, I would like people to check their cell phones and make sure they are off and otherwise inconspicuous. Um, the, what we're going to do is, is uh, as a format, is have Professor Gabriel talk for 45 minutes, and then uh, we'll have question and answers. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Giannis Gabriel, today's speaker. Uh, professor Gabriel is a professor of organizational theory at Bath University in Britain and senior editor of organization studies. His current research includes work on the importance of an ethic of care in health and education, the dark side of certain organizations captured in the concept of miasma, which we will hear about today, the relation between image and narrative, and the exploration of the ways in which clinicians defend themselves against work-related anxieties. Professor Gabriel is well known for his work in organizational storytelling and narratives, leadership, management learning, and the culture and politics of contemporary consumption. He has used narratives as a way of studying numerous social and organizational phenomena, including leader-follower relationships, group dynamics and fantasies, nostalgia, insults, and apologies. Another area of his work has been dedicated to developing a psychoanalytic approach to the study of organizations. Professor Gabriel is the author of nine books, which I'm not going to list. The most recent is the third edition of The Unmanageable Consumer. His uh, enduring fascination as a researcher lies in what he describes as the unmanageable qualities of life in and out of organizations. Finally, uh, Professor Gabriel earned his PhD in sociology here at the University of California. So this is something of a homecoming. Um, and he has previously held professorships in organizational theory at Imperial College London and Royal Holloway at the University, at, at the University of London. So, today's talk is entitled Nostalgia and Conspiracy Theories in Right-Wing Ideologies, The Case of New Dawn in Greece, and the Risks for Europe. So, please, join me in welcoming Yanni Gabriel. Well, thank you, Larry. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you, uh, giving this talk. Uh, I am, uh, as Larry uh, explained, uh, I have long been interested in stories and storytelling and I hope that you will uh, permit me to, ch to say just a few things about the way I use stories and storytelling in my research. As Larry explained, I did my PhD at the University of California a long time ago. It was uh, on psychoanalysis and uh, uh, it, it led to my first book, which was a psychoanalytic book. And shortly after that, I wrote my first uh, non-psychoanalytic book, which was in the sociology of work. It was uh, a piece of industrial sociology on the catering industry. I'm somebody interested in cooking, and uh, I spent quite a bit of time with cooks and waiters. Uh, for about 10 years, I followed two lines of research, uh, psychoanalytic research and sociology of work research, which had no contact with each other. And then at some point, round about the mid uh, to late 1980s, I had a realization, which was that uh, mm, stories that uh, I routinely picked up in my field work doing uh, uh, industrial sociology in catering and other industries could furnish, could open important uh, windows into 
organizational life and could give us insights into some of the dynamics and politics that go on which are difficult to access differently. And then I realized that I had long had a kind of resistance to using stories as a respectable instrument for my research. Uh, why? Well, I grew up in Greece, as Larry said, in the 1950s, uh, long before there was television. There were very few visual stimuli in the world I grew up uh, in, but there was a lot of narrative. There was a lot of talk. There was a lot of storytelling. Uh, and uh, I grew up uh, in an environment saturated with stories. I now realize that Greece continues to be an environment saturated with stories, and the media act much of the time as disseminators of these stories. Later I did my military service, I served uh, a period of time in the Merchant Navy, and once again I was struck by the, by the power of stories and the way that stories were used to uh, create, construct reality, contest reality, defy uh, other, other preconceptions and so forth. And once I had finished my work in the catering industry, what I realized is that a lot of the stuff that I could remember, sometimes years later, were not the faces or the details about the research, but, that, but some of the stories that my respondents had, had told me. And even now, 30 or 40 years later, I can still virtually see in my mind's eye the stories as they were told at the time. And I realized that in, in communicating a story, a person sometimes reveals a lot more of themselves than in answering straight questions. And that stories may not be accurate depictions of what has happened, but sometimes convey something more important than precise facts, which is uh, fantasies, fears, emotions, and what people want to believe is true as much as what actually happened. So since then I have used stories and storytelling in a, in a wide different, in, in many different ways in my research. And today I'm going to focus in particular on two types of stories, nostalgic stories and conspiracy theories. So these are going to be uh, introduced, I'm going to offer you some insights about the way that these types of narratives are used, and then I'm going to link them with the kind of um, right-wing ideology that sustains and supports uh, extreme right-wing right, right -wing, uh, uh, ideologies of uh, uh, New Dawn uh, and other right-wing <coughs> organizations in Greece. So, stories and facts. Just a few, uh, a few introductory comments. Stories, of course, are not facts. They're ways of embellishing, of communicating, and on building uh, poetically on uh, some factual material. Stories may be more or less distance, distant from the factual evidence. And of course, stories are not, uh, um, are not sufficient to construct a forensic uh, account of <coughs> an event that has happened. Now, let me start maybe with a story uh, that I experienced at first hand in a recent visit in Greece. I was returning to the airport in order to leave for, uh, for England, and I was sitting next to an elderly gentleman and two young women. The train came to a stop and uh, there was an announcement by the speakers that the, the driver had fallen ill and had parked the train uh, and we were going to have to wait until a replacement driver was found. Uh, it turned out to be quite a prolonged uh, delay and I was waiting of course to get to the airport and I didn't want to miss my, my flight. And uh, the gentleman sitting opposite me uh, started a kind of tirade about uh, typical of uh, the driver to park the car, not care at all about what happens to the, to the passengers of the train, uh, and uh, just uh, only concerned about his, uh, his own uh, well-being. Uh, and um, I observed to him that, well, we didn't know how serious his illness was, and maybe it would have been irresponsible to uh, continue driving the train if there had been a heart attack, for example, or something, something else like that. Of course, he persevered with, no, no, it's just typical of how civil servants operate in Greece. And whereupon one of the young women observed that uh, train drivers uh, in, the, in the Athens metro are not civil servants. They are employed by a private organization. <laughs> that uh, intensified the animosity and rancor, 
and things threatened to get really quite ugly, uh, but fortunately the train uh, moved on and, uh, and the old man left at the next station. Whereupon the two, two women started uh, uh, a, a real tirade against him about how he, uh, an old man on a comfortable pension, could criticize everything and everybody and uh, suck the, 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 the state dry, dry of resources so that young people like them could never find jobs, etc. So this kind of, of uh, tiny, tiny incident uh, seemed to, uh, to, to draw out a kind of uh, scapegoating mentality that is very, very widespread in my country at this point, uh, where uh, lazy retirees, indolent civil servants, corrupt politicians, greedy plutocrats, and various parasites, to say nothing of the Germans, the IMF, and all kinds of other things, are routinely blamed for the desolation that has uh, afflicted the society. It was a kind of uh, a, a, a small incident, but one that really drove home how scapegoating has assumed a kind of uh, a powerful presence in the mindset. Who are we to blame? Who is responsible for what's going uh, on in this country? So, uh, talking about stories, just a few things before I move on to the why are stories important? Uh, maybe as, as linked to the, the one that I've summarized. One of the things about stories is that in their simplicity, they help us make sense of a world that can be very complex, complicated, confusing. Uh, stories generally have a, a simple moral. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have goodies and baddies. People who behave well, people who behave badly, and generally make... Uh, uh, make light of the complexities of life which can be sometimes bewildering for most of us. Furthermore, stories allow us to express our emotions uh, and sometimes powerful emotions of anger, approval, disapproval and uh, uh, as we will see shortly, uh, nostalgia is uh, an emotion that surfaces in many stories as well as uh, uh, a wide range of positive and negative ones. Furthermore, stories enable us to construct identities, both as individuals and as groups, very often in opposition and contrast and co contest to other stories, stories that we reject by those who are out, uh, uh, from outside our groups. And very often, stories are ways of contesting uh, established hegemonic narratives and so forth. In addition, they support our communities, and sometimes we will defend stories that support our, com our communities uh, with tremendous vehemence and find ourselves really, really threatened when, when our stories are not treated with, uh, with the respect that we uh, believe they deserve. And they enable us to learn from experiences of others. Uh, so these are, as an educationist, of course, as a lecturer, I'm very aware of how stories can uh, be very <coughs> supportive of, a, of an educational purpose, pedagogically, the memorable students remember them concentration accentuates in uh, once a story starts to get told unlike a series of bullet points with a story people want to not lose the plot they can't afford to let go so they're, they're quite powerful in this regard and they enable us to influence of course others advertisers uh, I think that in political discourse now storytelling is a very powerful uh, medium for influencing uh, uh, electorate in one way or another and generally they entertain console and warn this is in the way of a few preliminary remarks before I now come to talk about the two narratives that, that uh, interest me for this presentation, which are conspiracy theories and nostalgia. Uh, now, I first became uh, interested and aware of nostalgia, some research I did in the early 90s, where I collected a lot of stories from different organizations. And unprompted, I realized that many of these narratives uh, were nostalgic narratives. There were narratives about the organization of old, which was always seen as, um, as uh, a golden past, as uh, certainly much, uh, much preferable to the present, and one in which uh, the past was always, a against which the present was always emaciated, impersonal, and, 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 and troubled. So I became interested in nostalgia, and uh, I realized it's quite a common emotion, of course. Although there isn't so much written about nostalgia, it's a common emotion that supports, for example, wide areas of consumer society, uh, all the retro uh, advertising campaigns, uh, which uh, hark back at some uh, 
uh, golden uh, time. Uh, and it, it expresses a kind of uh, disenchantment uh, with the present and idealization with the past of the past. So as a whole, uh, you know, nostalgia is, is almost at the other end of the cont continuum from utopia. If utopia looks at some golden destination in the future, uh, mm, nostalgia looks at the present and the future in rather bleak terms against which the past uh, shines as a beacon. And uh, it fuels large areas of, uh, of consumption and it sustains nationalist visions. We will see how this happens very shortly. So, uh, nostalgia uh, involves certain uh, uh, interesting features. Almost anything can be uh, a focus of nostalgia. It, even hard times, poor times, hungry times can be uh, turned into a focus of nostalgic past. And, and nowadays we have this in some of the Eastern European countries which are, are now harking at the communist past as a time of solidarity, order and predictable uh, situation in, uh, in times of chaos, uh, anomie and everything else. So anything can become uh, an object of nostalgia. Leaders from the past, buildings from the past, cars, smells, uh, food and so forth. Uh, the past is idealized, and against it the present is emaciated, impoverished, and lacking. And invariably with nostalgia, there is a kind of radical discontinuity, a moment when the past is lost and cannot be brought back, a moment when uh, the, the innocence disappears and something happens after which we cannot reestablish connection with the, with the past. So this radical discontinuity is uh, quite in, uh, it, is quite important. The past is seen as irredeemably lost. So overall, there is quite a lot of evidence that whatever the discontent of today is, the past is constructed in such a way as to highlight exactly the opposite. So if today we are disenchanted because there is uncertainty, the past is presented as a period of certainty. If today we are disenchanted because of impersonality and massification, the past is seen as a period of care, caring and personal relations and so forth. Uh, so theorizing nostalgia, I've done quite a lot of that and uh, it enables, it enables or has been to become a somebody again. Through nostalgia we can support our ailing narcissism, especially uh, those parts of our uh, of our ego that have undergone quite uh, quite a serious uh, battering from being members of the orga of organizations, from not having the success we expected, and so forth, it enables us to claim that we have that we are part of a very much uh, nobler and more important period, uh, which nobody can take away from us. Uh, furthermore. Uh, nostalgia, unlike mourning or grief, is not a way of dealing with, uh, <coughs> with the past, but is more to do with the discontent of the present. And whatever the present is, uh, uh, anxieties, fears and discontents it's bringing, anxiety is trying to uh, compensate for those. Um, and uh, so it, it's uh, especially useful in organizations which inflict quite powerful uh, uh, injuries to our narcissism, especially one, when we realize that we're dispensable, when we realize that within most organizations we're just numbers and that uh, people come and go and uh, they don't leave much of a, of a, of a gap behind. And uh, This is quite a serious uh, insult to our narcissism, which can to some extent be um, uh, offset by, uh, by uh, nostalgic uh, um, narratives which uh, place us in the middle of an important uh, and significant moment in the organization when uh, great things were happening. So <coughs> I can hark back to my days in Berkeley in the early 70s and, uh, and impress my friends with having been here and so forth. Society uh, of old as loving, caring, the family metaphor is very powerful. An idealized notion of a family as caring is very powerful uh, in, uh, in many of those nostalgic uh, and I have theorized about how a, there is a cultural ideal which becomes incorporated in our individual uh, ego ideal against which we uh, judge our, our, our ego. And if this ego ideal can be enriched with the achievements, imaginary or otherwise, of the past, 
our ego can also d uh, deliver a great degree of, of solace. Now, all of this was fine and good, but uh, uh, for the last 10 years, I've been realizing that it's far too soft, far too timid uh, an approach to nostalgia, which kind of completely disregards uh, a kind of xenophobic, aggressive, and uh, frankly nasty uh, dimension of nostalgia that has been surfacing uh, again in many right-wing movements in Europe, but which was also a characteristic of fascist and, and Nazi ideologies, which were harking back at times of racial purity, at times of, uh, of uh, great success and heroism, and Richard Wagner's uh, uh, cosmos as, uh, as the kind of, uh, of uh, lost uh, golden age from which uh, uh, German society had uh, uh, irredeemably uh, been split off. So I came to realize that quite a lot of Eastern European uh, writers for the last 10-15 years have been arguing about um, a different type of, uh, of nostalgia. Uh, Boim, uh, a Russian author, argues that uh, for, the, for the Russians, the 20th century started with utopia and ended with nostalgia. And a whole range of, uh, of other authors have uh, emphasized this kind of uh, wave of nostalgia that has surfaced uh, in Eastern Europe since um, the 1990s, uh, which harks back uh, at the time before the fall of communism. Some of you may have seen the film Goodbye Lenin, which was uh, uh, excellently captured this, uh, this nostalgic uh, quality uh, for the times. Now, of course, what is it about communist society that could form the base of nostalgia? Well, it was a time where there was order. It was a time where people could be relied upon to have the right position in society. They could have jobs, etc. So uh, the past uh, emerges as a, as a moment of solidarity, stability, and, uh, and order against which the present uh, uh, is seen as chaotic, anomic, nasty, brutish, and short, and all the other things that you want to add there. Uh, and this is quite a powerful form of, of nostalgia, which sometimes leads to the longing for a leader who will restore the kind of order and, uh, and the stability that was experienced before, the, before the, the, the downfall. So this is a kind of aggressive nostalgia, which can be uh, juxtaposed to the sentimental nostalgia I outlined earlier, and which uh, also uh, idealizes the past, but this is a past which is quasi-mythical, certainly not a historical past. And nostalgia in general is an enemy of history. Nostalgia does not want uh, empirical testing against facts. Nostalgia wants e history or the past to be inoculated against empirical research. And in this aggressive nostalgia, the past is a, a past of heroism, purity, and solidarity, uh, free of parasites and undesirables. In other words, also uh, 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 of, of racial or nationalist purity. And um, a past not to be sentimentally recalled through rose-tinted glasses, but to be brought back by force if necessary. And this by force if necessary is the moment I think that he will uh, see later comes into the right-wing uh, right ideological mindset. Hello. Please take a seat. So, uh, aggressive nostalgia uh, becomes a part of uh, nationalist uh, ideology, which seeks to reclaim the nation, especially the nation as uh, something transhistorical with uh, eternal traditions and symbols and so forth, uh, and uh, sometimes can assume exterminational uh, qualities of cleaning the nation, and the word cleaning will come again and again in, uh, in what I have to say, of the undesirables and all the other pollutants that threaten, threaten its uh, enduring qualities. Uh, and seeks to restore this mythical uh, past, uh, but if necessary by, for by force, as we said. So unlike the sentimental nostalgia that I identified earlier, this kind of aggressive nostalgia persistently <coughs> Uh, tries to intensify, exacerbate the discontents of today by continuously emphasizes how far we have fallen from where we used to be. So there's a kind of sense of, not of radical discontinuity anymore, but of fall, of betrayal, of total collapse. And 
while sentimental nostalgia were, nostal uh, were, were uh, narratives of uh, loss, aggressive nostalgia replaces loss with uh, betrayal. Betrayal becomes quite crucial, uh, identifying who has betrayed this continuity. And, and this draws them, the emphasis on betray betrayal, traitors, is what draws these aggressive nostalgic uh, narratives very much close to my second narrative in this talk, uh, conspiracy theories. Now, if you were ever to come to Greece, you'd be surprised by the amount of conspiracy theorizing that uh, is uh, routinely uh, co conveyed in, uh, in the mass media, and uh, which is taken quite seriously. I should tell you that uh, for a long period in Greek history, the main uh, agent of conspiracy theory uh, uh, was uh, the US. So the US were responsible for anything from spraying uh, the population with uh, all kinds of, uh, of agents to reduce their, uh, their political uh, militancy or, or to uh, manipulating the population every conceivable way that you can think. Uh, conspiracy theories are very, very pronounced today in, uh, in the Greek uh, media and uh, there is even a, a second rate, a second level of conspiracy theory, uh, which is conspiracies about conspiracy theories and how they are pro uh, promoted. <laughs> Just a few things about conspiracy theories. I'm fascinated with, uh, by conspiracy theories and I've long been fascinated. Conspiracy theories can range, for example, from climate change, it's all a conspiracy theory, John F. Kennedy assassination, conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory about 9-11, uh, you notice this building there, which according to a variety of conspiracy theorists should not be there, but should have come down, had the, two, the Twin Towers been hit by, by planes. In fact, they were not hit by planes. They were uh, blown in from the inside, according to a variety of conspiracy theories, for a variety of reasons and by a variety of people. Uh, this is the one that I really love. Uh, the Americans never landed on the moon. Uh, there is a, a, a huge literature on uh, this particular conspiracy <coughs> theory uh, with uh, a variety of uh, supporting arguments. Do you see any stars in the sky behind? If they had landed on the moon, uh, wouldn't there be stars behind? Um, but of course, conspiracy theories are not at all uh, just uh, amusing uh, uh, little... Uh, uh, curiosities. Uh, the, the protocols of the elders of Zion, which of course are notorious, uh, notorious fraudery, uh, they were reproduced uh, more than 30 times and printed in Nazi Germany to support the view of the international <laughs> Jewish uh, conspiracy threatening to take over the world. And in fact, as I will show you a little bit later, it has resurfaced in uh, Greek uh, New Dawn uh, uh, publicity uh, repeatedly in the last year or two. Uh, this is a particularly nasty one, of course. It is the, the, the air accident that uh, led to the death of uh, the presidents of Burundi and uh, Rwanda, uh, and which uh, uh, was the signal for the start of the, of the Rwandan uh, genocide, uh, because it was seen as having been precipitated by the Tutsis. And of course, in these two pictures, it suggests how conspiracy theories can capture uh, a whole uh, uh, spirit of a time. Uh, Moscow, Moscow trials there with the conspiracies of uh, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Kamenev, uh, Bukharin, and of course uh, Thomas Oppenheim, Robert Oppenheimer there, uh, uh, you know, McCarthyite conspiracy and American activities and all that. So conspiracy theories are, are quite dangerous things. Uh, and there are stories in what sense are they stories? They are stories in the sense that they make sense of events and they propose relatively simple explanations of what happened and why. Who benefit, who benefited, who prompted the events and who lost from them. Very often, the, a conspiracy theory links uh, a, 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 an outcome to whoever benefited from that outcome and turning the person or the agent who benefited as the cause. Conspiracy theories simplify things. They like one cause, one consequence, not complicated <coughs> pictures. And um, they combine iconoclasm with plausibility. 
what Aristotle called very similitude. They seem plausible. And at the same time, they have a kind of simplicity. They're, some of them can be quite elegant, you can say. Why mess up with real theories and account? A, a conspiracy theory can cut through an awful lot of uh, complexity and present a relatively elegant, if totally fanciful, explanation of an event. And some of the conspiracy theories, of course, are mega conspiracy theories about, uh, about uh, conspiracies that try to take over the whole universe, uh, like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the Moscow Trials and McCarthyism, and others are micro conspiracy theories. This is a famous, uh, a famous uh, essay by Richard Hofstadter, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with, uh, The Paranoid Style in American Politics in which he engages seriously with uh, conspiracy theory and looks at them, uh, not disparagingly, but quite in a sophisticated uh, way, as, uh, 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 as the, the, the product of uh, the paranoid style of thinking, which in his view has long exercised a fascination to the American public and which grows out of anxiety, mistrust, and anger and suspicions of anything big, like big government, big corporations, and all the rest. So conspiracy theories express this uh, mistrust uh, uh, of, uh, of anything big. And Hofstetter is quite good at, uh, at discussing how conspiracy theories have this apocalyptic quality. They, they, they invest in the adversary diabolical qualities of power, intelligence, uh, all kinds of machinations, and the uh, enemy is seen almost as possessing some kind of metaphysical powers and, and can control the course of history. So history is controlled by a single agent who can maneuver things for his or her own benefit. Uh, you know, like in a James movie film, for example. Mm -hmm. So, two orientations towards conspiracy theory. Uh, of course, we have the implacable critics, people like uh, Karl Popper, Open Society and Its Enemies, in which he argues that conspiracy theories are essentially irrational, that they are not falsifiable, that they cannot be tested, and that anything that you test them again, no matter how severely it challenges the conspiracy theory can always be incorporated in the conspiracy theory as evidence of the diabolical intelligence of the enemy. So the conspiracy theory can accommodate any objection, any f there is no killer fact that will uh, disqualify it. But Popper and his uh, subsequent uh, uh, imitators have argued that also conspiracy theories are enemies of democratic institutions that conspiracy theories supplant uh, the belief uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the integrity of democratic institutions, political institutions. Everything and everybody becomes tainted. Everything and everybody becomes liable to corruption and liable to lying suspicion and so forth. So uh, they were implacably against these. And then we have equivocal defenders of conspiracy <coughs> theory. People who say that, well, we can't dis uh, you know, disqualify all conspiracy theories because, after all, we live in a world full of conspiracies. We live in a world full of cover-ups. We live in a world where, you know, President of the United States, Richard Nixon, who, who resigned, uh, uh, I think, just two days before I arrived in the, in the U.S. to be a student at the uh, University of California, uh, was, of course, systematically involved in a conspiracy. So how can you, di uh, how can you uh, d disqualify all conspiracy theories? Many of these theories turn out to be actually quite correct. So these argue the world is full of conspiracies and a healthy skepticism that the conspiracy theorist brings to his or her mindset is similar to that of a good scientist who is not easily fobbed off with, uh, with uh, uh, justifications and rationalizations and wants to see for himself. One uh, interesting thing is that conspiracy theories uh, are very, very sophisticated about the distinction between fact and story. And they argue that very often what is regarded as a fact turns out to be uh, a story, and very often an implausible story at that. So conspiracy theories uh, are sometimes uh, uh, provoke a more equivocal response from some of the uh, reviewers. 
And if we say, okay, well, let's try and find out. If nothing else, conspiracy theorists very often yeah, look at, uh, at uh, small details and try to draw conclusions from small details, similar to scientists. I'll skip that. So, where conspiracy theories and, and, and um, nostalgic, aggressive nostalgic narratives converge is the search for scapegoats, in particular, conspirators, traitors, and parasites who account for the betrayal, which accounts for the, uh, for the, for, for the uh, ba bad conditions in which we find ourselves today. That the bad conditions cannot be explained by many different causes, they cannot be the faults of our own actions, they have to be accounted for by some kind of scapegoat who, can, who uh, is held uh, accountable for, the, for this. And now we come to the, uh, to the uh, New Dawn movement in Greece, which in the last election uh, uh, got about 7% of the national vote. In some of the islands and in the city of Athens, it got as, as many as 10% of the, of the vote. Uh, and it is a movement that has uh, justifiably, I think, uh, uh, generated quite a lot of interest because it combines uh, uh, violence, overt violence, gangs of, uh, of uh, young men uh, who go about uh, beating people, especially immigrants, shopkeepers and others, prote offers protection for elderly people who are terrified of, uh, of crime, which has indeed surged uh, in many metropolitan uh, areas of Athens, and also harks back to a time when Greece was, uh, was uh, a, a nation free of uh, a variety of uh, pollutants that I will explain in a minute and seeks to bring back kind of historical account of the nation with its historical symbols and so forth. So the past seen uh, as a, a time of, uh, of heroism and purity which are missing from the present uh, and they, and they uh, advocate and uh, uh, freedom from occupiers. So at the moment Greece is seen as a, sta as a country in a state of occupation. The occupation is in fact the, for the, the institutions of the European Union, the International Monetary Fund and the European Bank, which control basically the budget and most of the social and economic policies of the state at this moment, which have to be vetted by various bureaucrats before they can be put in, into effect, controlling things like pensions, controlling things like uh, uh, nationalization and so forth. Furthermore, elimination of uh, parasites uh, and foreigners uh, and a return to the heroic pre-modern past free of left-wingers, uh, corrupt politicians and a variety of shirkers. This is kind of constantly evoked in the rhetoric of, uh, of New Dawn. Uh, the ability to control the frontiers, which has become quite a big issue, especially with the influx of large numbers of refugees and economic migrants in the last two years. So here are some of the slogans that you will find if you visit the, uh, the new Do the Golden uh, Dawn uh, website, and which are routinely rehearsed in uh, in their public uh, in their public uh, 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 rallies and so forth. Blood on our Golden Dawn. This is the kind of uh, uh, chief motto of the organization. Blood, which of course uh, evokes uh, both purity of blood, the willingness to shed blood, and the will willingness to give their own blood. So it's quite a, a powerful uh, symbolic uh, 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 idea. Purity of blood, uh, bloodshed, and, uh, and uh, willingness to, to, to sacrifice. Honor, of course, which is brought, uh, which is seen as uh, the opposite to the state in which the country finds itself at the moment. In, uh, uh, you will find that to be a Golden Dawn member means that I reject both communism and liberalism and subscribe to nationalism, the third great ideology. This is something that they have uh, inherited directly from the fascists uh, in, the 19, uh, in the 20th century in which they adhere to very strongly. They're equally against the communists and uh, the, the liberal uh, or capitalist. Uh, an ideological formation does not turn into a social movement until it enters a whirlpool of struggle and contradictions. This is a, a, a phrase that I picked up out of its manifesto because it, it uh, very clearly indicates why they engage in, in, in a wide variety of, uh, of uh, acts of violence, including political assassination, and it's the political assassination of Paul Feisers, the uh, left-wing rapper and, uh, and artist, that has now brought uh, 
uh, the Golden Dawn movement to a serious standstill as 69 of its members are, are, are um, uh, currently uh, in, uh, undergoing a trial. Uh, and then you find the kind of this is the, this was the this was the uh, the slogan under which they fought the last election. Let's rid the country of this stench. And this was in every meeting and every rally. This was the slogan. I counted 91 uh, times the word stench on the website of uh, of uh, uh, Golden Dawn. So this kind of notion of putrefaction of uh, uh, pollution of impurity is uh, one that uh, uh, suffuses uh, the rhetoric of uh, Golden Dawn. Now, these are some of the recent headlines that I picked up uh, from uh, the publication of uh, Golden Dawn online, which you can find also in, uh, in English because they have quite, uh, quite a supportive following in the US, partly by the Greek community in the US, we fought for, for 400 years so the Islamists would leave we shall, we shall stop them again these are just the headlines from a variety of articles they published the Ministry of Education is destroying mines the Turks are threatening 3 million illegal migrants are preparing to set sail for Greece Turkey supplies jihadists with, with chemical weapons Greece is one big hotspot the anti-Hellenic government's plan for the permanent resettlement of hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants Golden Dawn paid homage to the Battle of Dolma. It's a battle uh, that uh, uh, is uh, used to evoke the heroism of the past. And routinely, Golden Dawn go and commemorate uh, battles, sometimes uh, uh, centuries old, uh, which nobody else has ever heard of. Uh, of. Uh, Kamenos and Tsipras are committing national treason and such like. So you get a sense of the kind of, of narrative that, uh, that this uh, Golden Dawn... Yeah. So... Very recently, last Friday, there was a big, uh, a big uh, rally that uh, Golden Dawn had called in Piraeus, which at the time had uh, about four to 5,000 uh, Syrian and, uh, and uh, Afghan refugees uh, in uh, uh, makeshift uh, uh, tents uh, along the quay of the main port of the, of the country. And uh, this is the, the left-wing uh, counter-rally organized by the, communist, uh, by the Communist Trade Union and other uh, uh, left-wing organizations, quite substantially bigger than that of the, of, the, of, the, of the Golden Dawn, by all accounts. But Golden Dawn uh, did achieve what they had intended, which was uh, violence. There was quite a, quite a bit of violence. Nobody died, but there were a lot of reports of uh, people being quite severely beaten up and ending up uh, in hospital. I incidentally do some teaching in Greek universities, and on one of my visits uh, uh, two years ago, three years ago, I did witness uh, uh, a charge of uh, Golden Dawn supporters in uh, one of the Greek universities uh, engaging in, uh, in uh, uh, quite savage battles with uh, some of the students. Uh, both groups were uh, equipped with cudgels and, uh, and uh, uh, other in instruments. Nobody actually got very serious, seriously hurt, but uh, it was a nasty moment. So, nostalgia, uh, and uh, now to, to bring this to a conclusion, nostalgia and conspiracy theory, they converge on a search for scapegoats who come for betrayal, and uh, they evoke two uh, ancient Greek uh, rituals, uh, the ritual of pharmacos and the ritual of uh, ostracism, both of which were meant to cleanse a city of undesirable elements. Pharmacos were micro-scapegoats, people who were... Uh, who were weak, who were parasitical, who were not making a contribution, uh, whereas ostracism was the formal procedure whereby uh, in ancient Greek cities a politician or a leading figure could be uh, expelled and exiled from a city purely on the basis of a straight, uh, of a straight ballot uh, if more than half the citizens uh, cast a ballot to, to evict this uh, person, they could do so with no need to justify. And uh, uh, the cleansing metaphor which surfaces over and over again uh, both in the, in the, in the rhetoric of, uh, of uh, uh, Golden Dawn but more widely too and it is this uh, cleansing metaphor which I want to uh, end up with uh, because I think that it is the cleansing metaphor which uh, gives you the, the key into the kind of uh, uh, deeply authoritarian uh, state of mind 
in which uh, uh, we find ourselves at the moment. Who is uh, Europe's economic scapegoat? Who is Europe seeking to clean up its act? Who receives without giving anything back? Who lives beyond the means through benevolence of the European family? Uh, who routinely fails to honor agreements, contracts and procedures? Who should this agent be pressed to leave, as in the case of Brexit, uh, or disciplined and purified through a series of austerity measures? <coughs> so Greece as a nation finds itself very often uh, at, on the receiving end of uh, discourse of uh, parasitism, of uh, irresponsibility and of serious need of uh, what you could call redemptive cleansing, that it's good not just economically to clean up the country, to modernize its economy, to get rid of a lot of inefficiencies and, and corrupt institutions, but it's also to purify its soul. Morally, it's good for that if you listen to Mr. Uh, Schäuble, the German, uh, the German finance minister, uh, and to teach them profoundly uh, a, a lesson about the errors of their ways in the past. And this is what, what uh, brings me to this notion of miasma, which is uh, a profound state of, uh, of uh, uh, political, social, and even spiritual corruption, uh, a highly contagious state, which is captured, for example, those of you who have read uh, uh, Camus' book, uh, uh, The Plague, uh, which does not discriminate between deserving and undeserving uh, 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 targets, but which corrupts uh, a whole uh, body politic, its institutions, it's, it pits, it pits uh, neighbor against neighbor, uh, child against parent, brother against sister, by undermining uh, any faith or an, any sense of solidarity, any sense of uh, uh, unity and being together. So this notion of miasma has been one that has really preoccupied me quite a lot for the last 10 years. Uh, and it is a state of uh, uh, pollution which is kind of moral, uh, spiritual and social and which affects everybody and which uh, uh, is highly contagious. This is the quality of... You, you think that you can put barriers and you discover that in... Uh, and this is the essence of Greek tragedy, that the more barriers are placed uh, to stop the contagion and to, to prevent the contagion from, from reaching deeper, in fact, uh, they, they prove quite ineffective, as in, uh, as in Camus, of course, uh, account. A and, of course, uh, in uh, Thucydides' account of the plague in Athens in 429 BC, that it uh, leads to a constant quest for scapegoats uh, and a constant uh, uh, paranoid mentality of looking for traitors, looking for parasites and busybodies and other people who undermine the, uh, the, the, the health and uh, unity of the nation and it attempts uh, to, to purify through a variety of scapegoating uh, rituals uh, in fact have the opposite effect they reinforce the condition of miasma just like uh, when Oedipus tries to cleanse the city with the variety of uh, measures that he announces the result is exactly the opposite so the attempts to, to cleanse uh, uh, the, the, the city of the miasma have the, the opposite consequence. And this, I think, is a, is a kind of uh, threat for uh, European uh, uh, Union at the moment. Uh, the threat of uh, looking at uh, people, the, the dispossessed uh, uh, people, vast dislocation of people moving into, into Europe, looking at them as undesirables, as uh, unclean, as uh, bringing with them uh, uh, a, a source of pollution and contamination and the attempt to build more and more walls and barriers and frontiers the attempt now to, uh, to build uh, huge walls between countries like the one that has been erected overnight between Greece and, and the state of Macedonia so this I think is a, a fundamental uh, uh, risk I don't say that, that Europe has been gripped by, gripped by state of miasma at this point but I look at it as a distinctly distinct and serious threat which uh, only solidarity and constant vigilance uh, can, uh, can combat. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I've given you some kind of indication of my reasoning and uh, I'm happy to uh, engage in some uh, helpful discussion. Thank you very much.
Right. Before we get to the question and answer, I have a point of order here. That is, it seems to have been a rather substantial draft in the room. Actually, I mean, it could be our vote. That didn't close it all way. Yeah, that was substantial. I don't mean to go all of them, but I mean, I thought they were there. Okay, yeah, okay. Announce. Okay. Um, so, please, um, can you open the floor for questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> um, it seems like these various elements, nostalgia, conspiracy, miasma, just sort of float there by themselves. Do we need a some kind of psychology? to figure it out who's susceptible and who is it. Is there some kind of way in which it touches down and then we can identify where that is in society or in an individual psyche? Okay. Yeah, I think this is a very, very important question. I looked at miasma in the context of an organization, an organization that I knew extremely well and in which I spent quite a, a long period of time. And Three of the features that, uh, that pointed me in this di direction of miasma were the following. Uh, first, that the, uh, the paralysis of resistance. So you would think that when people are threatened, and the threats are very palpable and visible, they would resort to the usual means of resisting, organizing, but there was a kind of paralysis of resistance and a withdrawal into shame and, and depression. Uh, second, there was this notion of, uh, of contagion. People thought that, oh, well, it, it won't affect me. Uh, but it did affect them. Uh, they thought that, well, my private life, I can protect it. But in fact, they found for many of them, uh, the, the private lives were deeply affected by the presence of miasma in the organization in which they worked. Uh, the third feature that, uh, that I noticed uh, in, in that organization was the constant scapegoating of the leaders. The leaders were seen as murderers, and especially the people who had been, uh, who had been uh, uh, dismissed had been seen as dead wood, as parasites who had brought the quality of the organization down. They had been uh, gotten rid of without separation rituals, without farewell speeches, without uh, uh, goodbye parties. They had disappeared from one, one, to the t one day to the next. So these people, the leaders of these organizations, were seen as uh, having blood on their hands. And uh, the victims of, uh, of, their, uh, of their purges are seen as having uh, been uh, uh, basically exterminated. So these three features sort of uh, came together in the notion of uh, purification ritual and why they, they backfire. Now, I mean, there are plenty of psychological explanations to do with uh, mourning and uh, what happens when uh, people disappear without uh, the, the appropriate rituals being observed uh, and these between and, be be between and betwixt uh, moments when pollution can spread. Please. Um, I was wondering whether you could delve a little bit more into uh, the conspiracy theories not necessarily implying that they're false, that it could be actually dissent from the orthodox point of view or the economic orthodoxy. It's, it's more the dissent movement, but others could say it's a conspiracy theory. Yeah. And even thinking of the way Bernie Sanders, in his campaign, does talk again and again about the big banks being the yes. main cause of our inequality in America. And you could say that's a conspiracy theory, but a, mo a lot of his supporters would never use that term. Of course. Um, they say it's, it's ba based in fact, even though we don't have all the details. Yeah. And just do some distinguishing. It's interesting to, co to juxtapose conspiracy theory, say, with uh, whistleblowers. Uh, a whistleblower is uh, authorized to speak because he or she has inside knowledge. Whereas a conspiracy theory uh, is uh, or somehow um, labeled in such a way as to cast the speaker in the role of a nutter or somebody who is a fanatic 
or somebody who cannot be believed. Yeah. And I th- I, in that regard, I think that um, the, uh, there is now the argument which says that dismissing all conspiracy theories as uh, the work of nutters is itself uh, uh, an exercise in conspiracy theory. So how about in the case, for instance, in looking at our American election going on right now, where yeah. there is the tendency to, to, to um, kind of break down the complexity. In, yeah, in exactly. Sort of having one or two basic causes, you know, whether yeah. it's free trade agreements or it's the big banks or it's the immigrants. But we don't use the term conspiracy theory. Yeah. Um, but I think that sometimes uh, you create political stories, and political stories don't have to be conspiracy theories. There are other versions of political stories. One, for example, is the, <coughs> the Jeremiah, is a well-known genre in American politics, uh, <coughs> which has more to do with nostalgia. Uh, but that's why I'm a believer in facts. I think that it's not enough to create a plausible story. I think that uh, serious political beings and citizens in a society where we have obligations and so forth, we need to look at facts as well as, uh, as plausible explanations uh, and, and conspiracy and other theories. And does, a, does an explanation uh, stand up to scrutiny? Does it hold water? Uh, what would be a killer fact or something that would disqualify it? Is there any evidence to the contrary? Are there any contravening factors? Uh, very often we look at, at something as being the resu- one cause, one outcome. Very often you have an outcome that is, is the result of uh, a resultant of many different forces, none of which desired that outcome, but this is what happens in the end. Please. Uh, thinking about the World War II history of uh, Greece and um, how it survived the Nazi occupation, uh, how does that history uh, influence what is happening now with the left and the right? Do the right identify with? How did the right? Well, Greece after the feel s- after the Second World War having been one of the countries that you know, sustained m- more deaths and injuries than any other in Europe, uh, it, uh, it had a, a seven-year civil war in which, uh, of course, eventually the right was uh, victorious and large number of left-wing uh, uh, fighters and their families had to leave Greece uh, and seek uh, refuge in countries like Poland, where it was last week were quite a significant number of, uh, of Greek people grow, grew up. Uh, the irony of it was that while uh, the right was victorious in the Civil War, uh, ideologically the right never managed to consolidate its victory. And if anything, uh, at least since 1981 in the election of, uh, of the socialist government of Popaner, there was a quite a strong ideological dominance of the view that the that the right had oppressed uh, and uh, Greece over a period since the end of the Civil War. We have the junta with the support of Americans, the support of uh, other reactionary forces, that they had uh, uh, massively uh, uh, oppressed, uh, uh, exiled, uh, killed even uh, thousands of people. And find that the, that the, that the, the, the the moral superiority lay with the victims, with, with the losers. Mm-hmm. So I think that to this day, the right is struggling to, to discover a rhetoric that, uh, that uh, uh, places it in, uh, in a desirable position. And that's, I think, where the, the Golden Dawn have very militantly tried to fill in that gap. Mm-hmm. So, the uh, news reports that uh, there is this reaction to uh, German uh, Angela Merkel making visits frequently to Greece and uh, being de- somewhat dependent on the European Union for its uh, economy and its survival. Is that also a reaction, a continued reaction? Uh, the, there is a very strong anti German feeling now in, in, in Greece. And uh, 
Mm, I think that that's not just just by Greeks themselves, but there is a sense that uh, the German insistence on, on austerity is unsustainable. Suddenly the IMF has become uh, an ally to, um, let's say, more radical or progressive forces in Greece by arguing that the debt, as it currently stands, is unsustainable, and that therefore it will sooner or later have to be forgiven, or at least a large part of it. Uh, so if it's going to be forgiven, why not sooner, rather than uh, continue to inflict uh, untold of suffering uh, on people? Um, I want to go back to your opening remarks about uh, narratives and storytelling. Uh, one of the easy juxtapositions, of course, which we all often hear, is that um, in the quantitative world of social science, um, we're not dealing with stories, we're dealing with facts and so on. So I want to tell a story. <laughs> uh, when I was a graduate student, I studied with a rather famous methodologist, um, L.S. Robinson, and here's the story he told. He said he was in graduate school with Paul Lesersfeld, one of the giants of American uh, methodological uh, social uh, analysis. And um, he, here's the story he, said, he told. He said, um, all table reading is storytelling. And here's how he explained it. He said, Lesersfeld had some three or four teaching assistants, and they came to him with this material, with these tables. And Lesersfeld saw them and began to interpret them, and he told his assistant how he was going to interpret these findings. Um, and then one of the, uh, one of the uh, assistants said, no, no, Mr. Rathersfeld, um, you, you've read the tables this way. They should be read this way. And Rathersfeld, without blinking, according to W.S. Robinson, said, oh, and then he, he just changed the storyline. Now, Robinson tells the story in order to break down this notion that storytelling is what uh, humanists do, and science is what people with cognitive work do. Um, and there was a period, pardon me, in, um, in the last two decades where the postmodern, post-structuralist uh, emergence began to actually take a, on a powerful role in, in, the, in this world. And I wondered if you could just comment in general on this, the story I just told, and what it had to do with the question about where narratives have compelling power because they have numbers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. A story very often evokes a counter story. The story you just told, uh, Troy, makes me think of another story where uh, a group of uh, mountaineers get lost in very thick fog while, uh, while exploring part of the Alps. And uh, they're really quite, uh, quite troubled, quite uh, be beginning to panic until one of them produces a map which uh, enables them to find their way and get back to, to base. And when they get back to their base, they discover that the map was a map of the Pyrenees, not a map of the Alps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so that sometimes <laughs> you get to the right place. So it's a kind of placebo effect. You need the map, even though it's not the right map. And I think that sometimes the story can have this, this kind of placebo. It's good to, if the story can capture the essence of the statistics. I'm, I love stories, and, and I'm a great believer in stories and storytelling, but I'm not going to dismiss uh, facts. I'm not going to pretend that uh, facts are irrelevant. And that's why I was never taken by postmodernism. Uh, Poststructuralism is different, but postmodernism is more at least a more extreme version, well, which yeah. said, you know, the war in Iraq never took place, it was all for TV. Uh, you know, I, I think that. 9-11, I think, was uh, the death knell of that crazy postmodernism. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to uh, go back again to the historical legacy issue related to the New Dawn. Um, it seems to me that there is a bit of a contradiction, actually, um, uh, in, in the sense of a relationship between the Greek nationalism that you see represented by the New Dawn and the kind of vision of fortress Europe, some kind of a pan-European <coughs> bastion of uh, resistance against, in this particular case, Islamization and so on. Um, and again, part of what you said testifies to the fact that for all, apparently, for all the ideological proximity that the new dawn might feel with regard to 
with the Sikh Third Reich, Hitler personally, there's also enormous animosity towards Germany mm -hmm. and Germans. So I would like you to comment a little bit more on um, the tension between these two commitments on the part of the New Dawn. And actually, this is pretty much um, this pretty much applies to all other right-wing movements, contemporary right-wing mm -hmm. movements in, in, in Europe, in Hungary, in Italy, and so on. You have, on the one hand, this commitment to pan-European unity to resist Islamization, but you also have enormous squabbles and enormous quarrels mm -hmm. and discontent with regard to other European nationalists that prevents unification of these right-wing yeah. movements. I would tell you that my impression is that Golden Dawn, first of all, very, they admire Hitler and the Nazis quite overtly. Uh, they, although, you know, when prompted, they will say, of course, we're not. What is the evidence? There's quite a lot of evidence of, uh, of uh, Nazi memorabilia, insignia, and so on having been found in their possession. Uh, the, the mode of organizing is the, the violence, the nostalgia, the hero, the hero. Uh, worship of the leader, a uh, whole variety of things are, are classic uh, fascist trademarks. And I don't think that the, the Golden Dawn is pro-European. Golden Dawn is anti-European. Is that Greece should stand alone and uh, by becoming uh, Europeanized, we're in fact compromising the security of our, of, our, of our borders. Instead of our glorious army standing up, to all those uh, uh, intruders, we have to rely on those soft belly uh, uh, Europeans to do the job for us. In fact, their, their uh, argument is not at all pro-European. But I would say, and I really don't want to leave you with the impression that, uh, that the Golden uh, Dawn is, uh, is uncontested. In fact, there is a very, very strong movement of solidarity in Greece, I would say, more than virtually in any other country that I've seen with the possible exception of Sweden in, in Europe, uh, of uh, support, of, uh, of uh, uh, helping the refugees. In fact, Greece has, within living memory, uh, pictures and uh, imagery of Greeks themselves being refugees. So we are not going, to, uh, I'm not going to generalize and say the majority of Greek people are, are, are embracing these uh, right-wing ideologies. But don't they realize uh, that Greece, taken separately, yeah. is in a way the Greek economy, the Greek population is unsustainable. I mean, in this struggle that they imagine, that it needs international allies. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what you know the reality principle says. Right. But in their mind, I mean, that that's a, a point of view that they shared with Syria. They they believe that they Syria came to power promising that they would get rid of the memorandums, they would throw the Troika out of Greece, they would, they would not have to do any of those things that they have ended up. So now, in fact, and that's the, the one serious risk that uh, political analysts uh, raise, that they, Golden Dawn has become now virtually, along with the Communist Party, the only two political forces in Greece that still maintain that Greece is sustainable without European support, without European institutions. Uh, and of course, they are entirely for uh, uh, leaving the euro. Yeah. Uh, yes, I just want to go back to where you were referring to my asthma. The one reaction to my asthma is the constant building up of, of barriers and yeah. walls. Um, and I thought you uh, said that this <coughs> was somehow counterproductive, this building of the walls. Mm -hmm. um, and related to that, you said it was the essence of the Greek tragedy. So I wanted to ask you if you said anything specific about Greece that was conducive, say, to this mindset. More well, than I, yeah, I, th I think that there was a very something very important. Yeah, I think it's the tragic uh, predicament of humanity that there are terrible things happen and they don't have simple causes. People try to escape terrible uh, uh, predicaments. And in seeking to escape from these predicaments, they make the predicaments worse. You know, uh, Creon uh, uh, says that I'm not going to have the dead body of, uh, of uh, Eteocles in my city, throw him out to beaten by the dog out of the city, you know, thinking that this way I'm going to protect my city from the 
the politan, the, the traitor, of course, who has raised seven armies and attacked Thebes. And precisely by doing that, what, how does Antigone end up, you know? Uh, his own son dies, Antigone dies, and the city of Thebes continues to be haunted by pestilence and everything else. So, you know, in the, in the Greek mindset, it's a very, very important, uh, this notion of, uh, of miasma, and that uh, it doesn't have uh, a simple cure, and that once it takes hold, it uh, attempts to cleanse the city, usually have the opposite effect. Yeah. I'm wondering about the role of political context in your conceptualization, because you're pretty social, psychoanalytic and focused, but yeah. it, it seems to me like the like nostalgia and conspiracy theories don't just take root anywhere. They really pop up where there's a ripe, like the right kind of political and, and social soil. Um, so I'm wondering if New Dawn, uh, I mean, just a question about framing. I mean, can you use the same the same concepts to, to tag New Dawn as an example of an ugly example of nostalgia and conspiracy theories? It's also a, a direct reaction to the economic turmoil, political marginalization, and the kind of social turmoil in Greece. Of course, you see, that, that's why the, I mean, these conditions are what prompts the search for scapegoats, the search for traitors, the search for parasites, the search for an understanding of who has brought all this about. And I think that there is a kind of, uh, of vacuum of, uh, of a core narrative to account for the, for the desolation. Uh, so there are different narratives and stories competing against each other. No, it's the plutocrats who have brought it about. No, it's the previous government. No, it's Papandreou. Papandreou, of course, uh, was a uh, uh, very popular leader, George. Uh, not, not his father, who had been a professor here. But you've never seen a political leader in Greece so suddenly collapse from, uh, you know, extremely popular, more than 40% of the, of the vote, to leading a party with less than 5%. Uh, so he was uh, he was scapegoated dramatically overnight for signing up the first me the first batch of measures. Huh? Just a real quick question. So, just your personal perspective and, and your prime minister Cyrus is that how you pronounce it? The current Cyprus. Cyprus. Um, do, would you say that his explanation? Just as an economist, a factual economist, his explanation for the crisis of Greece, in in general, does lay out the facts, um, and yet some people don't want to believe. I mean, I I have read long articles where yeah. I'm quite convinced by his explanation. Do you mean uh, Tsipras, or do you mean the the previous uh, uh, the finance current, minister? Your Tsipras. Yes. Yeah. Tsipras yeah. Tsipras is not an economist, but... Oh, he's not an economist. He, he, he's, he's an engineer. Uh, but his explanation is, uh, is one that a lot of my economist friends say that is very plausible. Yeah. And, you know, Paul Krugman says that it's very plausible. Uh, a lot of very serious uh, economists say that it is very plausible. Okay, Varoufakis had a very plausible uh, account, which was this debt is not sustainable, the Europeans will have to give in. The Europeans didn't give in. So what happens? At the economic level, they had a very good explanation, and at the, at the logical level, they believed that they had uh, rational interlocutors who would see the, the counterproductive consequences of maintaining a regime of austerity which in fact continues to depress the economy, continues to polarize society and all the rest. But unfortunately they didn't have, uh, uh, let's say, ultra-rational interlocutors. They had interlocutors who said, once you sign a contract, you have to honor your contract. Once you have made an agreement, you have to observe the agreement. Once you've, you've said that you will uh, rationalize your, your, uh, your national insurance and, uh, and pension scheme, you will do that. You haven't done any, done any of these things. So, whereas other countries, including Cyprus, have now moved beyond such memoranda and having their economies run from Central Europe, Greece is the one remaining country which has gone from bad to worse, and its debt has escalated quite dramatically in the last. So, the, the heroics of uh, Mr. Tsipras, you know, were very impressive but they were costly at the level of uh, of uh, of e economics. But, and nowadays, you see, 
the banks only still still only give uh, 400 euros out uh, per, 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 per week. So people can't go out and take all their savings if they want to. And uh, the, the economy continues to be very, very depressed. Um, I, I think I'll take the last question, um, which is listening to your uh, uh, psychoanalytic explanations of things, I kept waiting to hear the word projection. Mm -hmm. So I, I kept wondering at what point are these uh, elements of nostalgia, elements of conspiracy, um, are they uh, feeling, dealing with feelings of the evil, the bad thing is within, mm -hmm. and, and finding something out there, and, and is, is that something you could locate in Golden Dawn? I think that I, I can locate it in, in many strata of uh, uh, Greek political life. The, the attempt to expiate oneself from direct responsibility and project the blame onto others, uh, whether it be the blame for economic policy. The, and in fact, in my blogs, this is one of the things that, uh, that I have argued. It's very impossible for Greeks any, to find a single Greek who, who takes any responsibility for the calamities that, uh, that afflict the, the country today. Of course, there is a massive projection at all levels and, and from everybody. No politician has acknowledged any share in, uh, in, uh, of responsibility in what has happened to the country. Yeah. Well, can you join me in saying, oops, let's have a last question. Uh, uh, excuse me, I, was, I missed the, the introduction. Uh, are there any future lectures on on this subject, or how this this um, project came up? Well, this project came up because I have uh, written extensively about nostalgia and and conspiracy theories. Uh, right now, I'm writing about these two types of narrative as types of counter narrative. I mean, and I have this idea of narrative ecologies and different types of spaces where narratives meet each other contest each other and so forth. And I received uh, an invitation from the Center for Right-Wing Studies, uh, so I contextualized my argument about uh, nostalgia and conspiracy theories wi within right-wing ideologies. That's how it came about. Okay. At the moment, we don't know uh, anything about the future, if there are going to be any lectures no. Related to this I think that this this is, this is this is a one-off. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it one it's being video recorded. So That's true. It will be available on our website uh, as a video. Mm -hmm. and but, book. Uh, pardon me. And is there a book? On this? Not on this. In, in, uh, uh, in that is say relative to Golden Dawn, but um, uh, you know. Professor Gabriel's work is available in, in, in a number of different uh, volumes. Um, so no, this isn't the beginning of a, of a series. This, this is, um, Professor Gabriel has come a long way and, and uh, it's not easily reproduced. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Gabriel.